So welcome everyone. I'm Nick Coombe from Solway Firth Partnership. And this talk is part of a project managed by Solway Firth Partnership to help you find out more about the archeology span on the Rins of Galloway. It's supported by Kigalia Community Fund. And the project includes three online guides to archeology span sites, which you can find on the Solway Firth Partnership site. And um, also a series of talks of which this is the first. Uh, with two more taking place next week uh, as part of Archaeology Month. So I'm going to hand over to Charlotte, who's going to lead on this. So I uh, hope you all enjoy it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, so I'm Charlotte. I'm an archaeologist. I work for AOC Archaeology Group. I'm their community archaeologist, so I, I, I'm always involved in community projects like this one. Um, and yeah, we'll take a sort of a whistle stop tour, I suppose, tonight through um, some of the main online resources that are available for um, exploring archaeology and heritage. Uh, there are loads and loads of them out there, obviously, and we definitely won't look at all of them. We'll look at sort of three or four in um, a fair bit of detail and, um, uh, you know, maybe mention at the end some of the other ones that are ones that I maybe don't use so much, but that are useful for looking at other records. Um, Sorry, just admitting someone else. Um, yes, so um, we've, I'm sure you've attended lots of um, Zoom events over the last 18 months or so, 18 months or so. Um, we've kept this one as a meeting format, which is why you can probably see um, the faces of uh, lots of other people who are attending. Sometimes when you attend a Zoom event, it might be delivered as a sort of um, a webinar where you can only see the panelists who are speaking. Um, the reason we've kept it as a meeting is because I'm keen for you to chip in and ask questions and, um, you know, let me know if there are specific sites and things that you're interested in trying to find out more about. Um, you uh, do have the power to unmute yourself if you want to, to chip in that way. Um, or you can also, um, I think, oh, can we see the chat? Is there a chat window? Yeah, can everyone see the chat window? I'll type a message and say hello. <laughs> So hopefully you can see there's a little window there. And if you prefer, you can um, ask your questions in that window there. And maybe Nick, you could help me out by um, uh, letting me know if there's a, a, a question in the chat window that I just haven't um, noticed. Um, so I think, what are we, 7.36. I'm just gonna sort of close off the meeting. Um, there we go. And we can get started. Um, I'm sure lots of you have heard that um, uh, not to start on a diner, but sometimes these uh, Zoom meetings can be sort of uh, 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 hacked, I suppose, by people we don't want in. So I've just shut down the meeting so no one else will be able to join from now on. So I'm hoping, can you all still see my screen? Yes, I can see a few of you nodding. That's good. All right. Um, oh, and I can see there are a few messages in there. So that's great. Move that over there. All right. So um, we will start off with uh, Canmore. So hopefully you can see the website loading up here. Um, Canmore is sort of uh, probably your first stop really for um, researching um, archaeological sites in Scotland. It's an online catalogue um, to Scotland's archaeology, buildings, industrial and maritime heritage uh, run by Historic Environment Scotland and it has everything from um, summaries of findings from previous excavations, um, recordings of when certain sites were first identified, um, historic photos, and also usefully it has references for where else to go to read more about certain sites. Um, so this is the uh, website that I go to in the first instance. If I know the name of the site that I want to find out more about, um, you can just use the search bar to find out, um, to find whatever you want to use. So for an example, I thought we'd start off with um, the Kilmory Stone. So just using the search, um, search bar up at the top right there. And I'll just be a bit vague and I'll just put in Kilmory. Not working, there we go. Um, so you can see the first um, window that it opens up. The first thing it does is bring up selection of images. I think possibly because um, Historic Environment Scotland would very much like you to buy their images. So um, this is not hugely helpful to us in the first instance. Um, I go straight away to click over to the site section. And then you can see here, we've got a list of seven uh, different sites which have the word Kilmory in their record and um, so sort of the more vague your search term basically the more results you're going to get and um, the more kind of searching around you might have to do to find the one you're um, after but one of the best ways to find the you know to to hone in on the site that you're actually interested in 
I usually just head over here and go to map. And then that brings you your seven sites on a map. So you can see there's one up here that's definitely not what we're looking for. We can zoom in there. I'm sorry if the, um, uh, the sort of the video might be a bit slow filtering through on your screens, but I'll try and move slowly so we can kind of keep up with each other. So you can see we've got two dots here in the rins and um, when we search Kilmore. First one down here. So when you click on your little dot, each of those is one of your um, sort of sites of interest. We get Kilmore Chapel. Uh, you can click there if you like to open in a new window. But I know that the one I'm after is this one here. And it opens up a new window itself. And here we go. This is the one we're after, the cross slab, the Kilmore stone. And so you can see at the top, we have a couple of photos. And then down here is kind of the really interesting textual information. Um, so a stone like this has been surveyed by the early medieval carved stones project. Canmore has lots of records that are kind of parts of smaller projects that then they've fed into, into this massive um, online archive for us. Um, it also has older records as well. So it has, um, uh, you know, little snippets, little excerpts from, um, from earlier publications um, that first, first mentioned the stone, for example. And then down here are references for um, where we can go to read more. So you can see these ones in particular, um, at the end it has an Arkham's shelf number. So Arkham's is the old, uh, sort of the old archive, I suppose, the Royal Commission on Ancient and Historical Monuments in Scotland. So these documents are not hugely helpful to us today, especially in COVID times when we can't uh, be going in to visit, but um, uh, yeah, it tells you it tells you basically where things have been um, reported on and published, and sometimes they have um, uh, references to journals and things that are available online um, where you could go and read the full records. So we'll talk about that a little bit more later. And then you can see down here as well quite a, um, a useful little feature on Canmore that we maybe don't think about enough, but you can actually contribute your own images. You can contribute text. Um, so that's sort of something to think about if you're um, very active in exploring um, the archaeology in your area is you can actually um, get involved and send in information yourself. Um, so just going back a little bit, we'll go to another search term. Now, when I tried this earlier, I think that Canmore helpfully uh, was having a bit of a glitch. Um, but you can see here on this site search page, I'm looking in the classification tab. Um, I'm going to go down to Roundhouse and we'll see if it's fixed and working by yet, uh, by now. Oh, okay, so I think their site is actually broken today because usually what would happen is you would go search sites, you would put in a site type here. And classification is, um, uh, Canmore has its own sort of preferred terms that it uses for a, um, any type of a site. So you can see that when I started typing Roundhouse, for example, brings up all these different terms with round in um, and usually when you click roundhouse it would bring up all the roundhouses and you can do the same again and um, all these other different sections you can use but I think there's just a glitch with the website today but let's go up here but in roundhouse this was working earlier there we go so roundhouse brings up um, as you can see 250 images 545 sites and um, all of those are listed there Again, we can go and um, use the map also. And um, the reason I've chosen roundhouse as a term to search, so you can see here's your dis distribution of roundhouses across Scotland. Um, now the roundhouse, of course, is the sort of um, complete uh, example of a prehistoric building. Um, but um, another um, term that you might use if you're interested specifically in these um, prehistoric uh, circular structures is hut circle. So what do we have? 545. Yeah, so hut circle. And here we go, so 4,000 um, results when we put in hut circle. So I've just um, searched those two different search terms, hut circle and roundhouse, to show you that um, your, uh, the, the results that you get back from your searches will only ever be as sort of accurate as the term that you search for. So roundhouse is hut circle, basically the same thing. The hut circle is the remains of the roundhouse um, on the ground. Um, and, uh, you know, before excavation, um, I mean, most of the sites that were, um, that are uh, included on the records here haven't been excavated. You would refer to it entirely as a hut circle. 
after excavation, you would then um, consider it to be a roundhouse. And so I suppose the point I'm trying to make is that, um, you know, sometimes the search terms are a bit vague. You can be using two different terms, but really you're kind of pulling out the same information. Um, so it isn't uh, a sort of a highly accurate way of gaining numbers, for example, of how many of a certain site type there are um, just by using a search term. Um, you can use the options down the left hand side here. So um, what had we searched here? We had searched Hot Circle, hadn't we? So we could go, for example, Dumfries and Galloway Council. That brings the number right down to 272. And you could then um, use your parish down here if you wanted to. Um, where should we go? Stony Kirk. And then that brings your number down to two. So if, for example, you're trying to find, um, you know there's a hut circle and you know roughly the area it's in, that's one way that you can kind of, um, uh, kind of uh, track down the, um, the data a little bit further to find out what it is that you're wanting to find. Um, so moving on from Canmore, we'll look next at past map, which um, you sort of almost use these in tandem, basically, past map and Canmore. It's effectively the same, um, a lot of the same information. They're both uh, run by Historic Environment Scotland and they're using the same data very often. But past map, the data is all presented in map form, as the name suggests. Um, so when you come into the homepage here, just go straight into enter there what you come up with is a map like this. You can see down the left hand side, we have all these different options and um, data layers. They also not available at this zoom level. You have to um, zoom in more closely and you have to zoom in quite close. In fact, actually for most of the data layers to show, but you can see, for example, here, um, conservation areas, for example, is there any within our, I can't see any of them highlighted there. But there, World Heritage Sites, for example, you can see that that shows up the um, Antonine Wall running across here, for example. So you have your different data layers depending on um, your kind of area of interest. You can see there uh, Canmore, which is the last site that we were just using. Um, scheduled monuments is also really helpful. That's all your kind of um, very uh, protected scheduled sites. Um, and then listed buildings also um, might be of interest. Your base layers down here, this is how you can change um, the mapping that's being used basically. Um, so you could be using the hillshade, for example, which you can see gives you a bit more information on the, um, the topography and the terrain. Normally I just stick with this one here. So PassMap is the, um, the website that I come to. If, for example, I've been out and about and I've noticed something strange, uh, something that I, I, you know, a site that I didn't know about before, and I, it would be quite hard to find it just by using a search term. So I don't really know the, um, you know, I don't have sort of detailed place name information for it or anything like that. Pass map is the site that I would use because um, you can literally just zoom in on wherever it was that you were. Let's go here. Um, turn on your relevant data layer and then you can see you get all these little um, blue dots appearing. So for example, we'll open up a, um, a nice one in the Rins, a fort just here. And when you click on, the, um, uh, click on the blue dot and over here, detail opens a new window that takes you straight back to Canmore. So the site that we were at um, before. And again, all your information is down here. This one's got more, more photos, some aerial photos and things like that. So um, yeah, so Canmore and PassMap, you're sort of using them in tandem with each other. Um, but it depends on which way you're looking for the information where if you already know the sort of um, the place name of the um, of the site that you're trying to find out information about, or if you know the location of it, but you don't really know the um, the name, you wouldn't be able to search for it te using text. And um, that's when I would come to FastMap. Um, let me just see. Oh, yeah. So um, I suppose one of the things to talk about with um, Canmore and PassMap these are both definitely kind of your, um, your place to go for uh, information about sites specifically. If you're more interested in a certain artifact type, for example, um, that's harder to, to find the information about basically. There are chance finds, for example, um, you know, if a, a metal detectorist has found something or things that were found um, you know, in, in years gone by, you might see a little dot in the middle of a field, for example, and I'll tell you there's an ax head or something. Um, but it's, uh, there isn't a sort of, a comprehensive archive for um, 
for artifacts in that way. These are very much kind of um, site focused. Uh, we will look a little bit later on um, when we look at one of the other websites at um, records of chance finds as they appear on maps and how you can find the information about that. But we'll look at that in a moment. The other limitation, I suppose, with both Canmore and um, PassMap is you can't really search by um, time period. So you can't, for example, say, oh, I'd like to see all the Iron Age sites. And um, certainly one of the reasons for that is that, of course, a lot of the sites that are listed on these websites aren't um, uh, aren't excavated. Um, you know, we might be able to guess at the um, time period or, you know, make a good estimate of the time period based on comparison with other sites. Um, but if they haven't been excavated, it's really impossible to confirm the time period that a site might belong to. So it won't generally be um, sort of categorized by, by time period on Canmore or PassMap. Um, I can see there is a question, do these sites need a subscription payment for access? No, everything that we're looking at tonight is free. These are all um, freely available. And what I'll do is after the, um, after the end of the workshop, I will put all of the links for these sites in um, a Word document and we'll send that around so you can find them. I meant to do that as we went along, actually, to send you the... Uh, um, send you the URLs. I'll quickly put them in now. So Canmore is the first one that we looked in. I'll put pass map in also. And I'll try and remember to add these into the chat as we go along so you can go and have a look at them as we're going, if you like. I won't be offended if you're not all eyes on my screen at all times. Um, uh, all right, the next one we'll look at quickly is the um, Dumfries and Galloway Council Historic Environment Record. Um, Dumfries and Galloway Council has a um, fabulous um, archaeology, uh, historic environment record sort of department. I'm sure lots of you have come across um, Andrew Nicholson and others. Um, and uh, they have also, where's the link to it? Here we go. An interactive map. Um, this is uh, by no means um, the norm for a local authority um, archaeology department. So um, yeah, it's a really great resource that they have a searchable map as well. Um, so that's worth bearing in mind if you're um, looking for information that way. And also, of course, this is not an online resource, but there are real people there who can help you out with your queries. So um, uh, yes, do um, um, check out the, the website there for more information about getting in touch with them. Um, all right, the next, well, I'll just pop that one into the chat. I'm sure lots of you have found these websites before. All right, next, Atlas of Hill Forts. I'm trying not to rattle through too quickly, but also, um, you know, do stop me if you have um, questions and queries as we go along, and also we can um, answer any questions that you might have at the end. So the Atlas of Hillforts, let's just reload that so you see what we get when we enter. Hopefully this is all loading okay for you. It takes a little while to load onto my screen and then presumably a little while to feed through onto yours as well. So you just need to agree to say you're going to go into the Atlas of Hillforts. Now, this is quite a new resource completed, I think, in 2017, um, a collaboration between Edinburgh, Oxford, um, Edinburgh and Oxford Universities and University College Cork. And as the name suggests, it maps all of the known or possible hillforts in Britain and Ireland, all 4,147 of them. Um, so it includes hillforts, um, you know, the um, uh, sort of enclosed uh, settlements on top of hills, but also promontory forts. There are lots of those in the rins. We can have a look at that. Um, and enclosures, which are you know, enclosed sites on um, kind of flatter ground. So you can see when you first go in, you have a map which has all these little orange dots um, marking each of the hill forts. So you can just go straight in, um, looking, at, looking at the dots and just zoom in on your area of interest. So to go into the rins here, you can see um, anyone who's been following the Facebook page, I have posted lots of pictures of promontory forts on the Rins because there are so many of them and they're so fabulous and exciting. Um, and you can see how along here in the sort of late Bronze Age and um, Iron Age, um, we have all these forts lining the edge of the Rins and it just shows really how central the Rins was in this Irish sea zone um, back then. Of course, all these forts weren't necessarily lived in um, at the same time, but the sort of density of them is, uh, is really fascinating. Um, 
yes so you can um search for this one by just clicking on clicking on a dot in the area of interest you know if you had noticed something when you were driving along or something this would be a good way of um of just um honing in on only the um hill forts but you can also use the search bar up here and um, let's use a, a rins example we'll go and look at caspin so you can see when you start typing it brings up some options for you to select um, up at the top we have caspin under hill forts and then also um, it gives you a more general location so you can just search by um, kind of area and see what's around there let's go and have a look at caspin specifically right up here in the north rins um, so you can zoom quite in zoom in quite far onto this um, aerial imagery caspin's a really nice site there's this massive big gully cutting off this um, promontory here and then the site was used later on as a kelping site so um yeah really um a really interesting site um so when you click on your little dot it brings up this kind of summary screen in the first instance and um you know the atlas of hillforts um is a really fabulous resource to have this much detailed information about over four thousand hillforts is kind of astonishing really um uh, it is a um a fairly in-depth resource i think it's fair to say so if we go to view full record it brings up this whole page, takes a little while to load because it's working with so much data. There we go. <clears throat> so we have our um, aerial imagery again. But if we scroll down, there's our summary again. Um, and, and lots and lots of information. So for example, it tells you, um, and it, you know, whether it's an extant board like this one, one that's sort of um, still visible, whether it's a crop mark, likely destroyed, all sorts of information down this site. I was talking a little bit earlier on about um, being able to find dating evidence for um, sites. So Caspin, not a great example for, <laughs> for dating, but um, on sites that have been dug, particularly sites that have been dug recently and there's scientific dating evidence, for example, all that information is um, in here. Um, so very, very comprehensive records, um, more information down the bottom about um, previous work and things like that tells you whether there are any um, artifacts, how they may have sourced their water when, um, when the fort was occupied. occupied. Um, pretty much everything you could possibly want to know about any hill fort will be in here. Um, and one of the kind of really fascinating and useful things about the Atlas of Hill Forts is that you can put in um, uh, queries. You can basically pull out the information that you want. So, um, you might, for example, only want forts that have definitely been dated to, um, here we go. Uh, yeah, so you might only want Iron Age hill forts, for example, this one says dating evidence 400 BC to AD 50. If that's what you want, you click apply there. Oh no. Oh, there we go. <laughs> okay, so it's brought up everything. Here we go. All the forts that have uh, the um, that are dated to within um, 400 BC to 50 AD are all these ones highlighted in blue there. So um, I won't <laughs> I won't take you through any more hypothetical scenarios of what information you might be wanting to pull out. But um, yeah, Atlas of Hillforts is really um, really fabulous um, for having all of that information available for you to use. Um, to really kind of drill down on on the information that you are um, trying to uh, trying to get. Um, yeah, I think that was everything I wanted to say about that. Some hillforts. All right, so moving on, we're going to have a quick look at the um, National Library map website. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'll put the URL in the chat there. <clears throat> All right, so you can probably tell, um, as with the other, a lot of the other websites, um, just by looking at the homepage, there's a lot to play with on the um, uh, National Library of Scotland's map, mapping um, website, excuse me, <clears throat> but really useful in the first instance is this blue button here, guide to this website, and this is a really good place to start just for um, sort of getting an overview of how you might best be able to find the information that you're looking for. So you may like to start there um, if and when you go off to the uh, 
to the um, map library website. So there's um, literally every single type of map you could possibly want. Um, but I'll take you through a, th a few of the different um, a few of the different options, a few of the different scenarios um, for ways of um, for ways of using the map website, the map library. All right, so in this one, we're in Map Finder with marker pin. And um, you can see here we have this blue marker in that just automatically shows up in the middle. Let's move that down to the rims. And you can see on the right hand side here, it's showing us all the different maps that are available for um, the area around our blue pin. The closer in we zoom, um, the sort of uh, more accurate the, the data will be. And hopefully you can see whenever I hover over a certain map over on the right hand side, it shows you the area of coverage on that map. Um, so you can uh, get a sort of a, a clearer idea of what it is that you, um, and what it is that you're looking for and whether the map that you click on will have the information that you want. So let's go to the earliest one we can see here. This is um, from the 16th century, brings up a new window here. And we just click on the map itself and then we go okay so we can see that this one actually the rins is a <laughs> pretty um sparse on information um it's more uh, further north that that map is um more useful oh need to shut that out again um but yeah some really lovely ones and um, blau for example these ones are really nice i mean i, I I do love a, an old map, but they're, um, I love the way they um, depict the castles, for example, here's Cotswold Castle with the trees all around it and the sort of 3D hills and something. These are really lovely for, um, you know, studying changes in place names and things like that. Um, yeah. Okay, so that's using the, um, the, uh, the map finder with marker pins. You can see loads and loads scrolling down forever. And they kind of get more and more recent. They're organized by um, date, basically. So the most recent one that you can see here is um, published 1971. So um, that's the first, first way that we'll look at for finding different maps on the map library. Um, OK, let's go geo-referenced maps. There we go. So these ones sort of um, for basically looking at maps in relation to existing mapping. So you can kind of chop and change between um, aerial imagery, for example, and, um, and the maps if you want to be able to compare um, kind of today with, um, you know, the, the things as they look today with, um, with the mapping information. You can see at the left down here, you can um, use the drop downs to select uh, the maps that you like. You could also put in a place name, let's put in Port Patrick up there. And so that'll zoom in and take you to it. Um, and you can just use the uh, these drop downs on the left hand side to click in between the different maps until you find the one that shows you the information that you want. You can see the category there, it says category Great Britain. You do get different options if you put Scotland. Um, it starts off with uh, Roy's military survey from the 18th century. Um, these ones are really lovely. I love the way they show the, um, the sort of rig and furrow, the um, cultivation in the fields um, according to the direction that they were uh, plowing in. Um, so yeah, you can scroll through those and, um, and see which ones are kind of most interesting to you. Another really useful tool, again, if you're trying to kind of compare the um, information on the map with um, with uh, you know how uh, with land use today down the bottom left there change transparency of overlay you can slide this left and right to um, kind of scale the map up and down I'm not sure if you'll be able to see that very clearly and um, with screen sharing but hopefully you can see that um, as I move the little marker the map disappears and the satellite imagery appears and other way around so that can be quite useful if you're trying to compare for example something that's marked on the map that's no longer on the visible on the ground, you'll be able to compare where, where technically that thing should appear if it still existed, for example. Um, so we'll look next at side by side. Um, let's 
to a six inch. There we go. So you can see we've got the same image mapping on the left, satellite imagery on the right. You can zoom in and out uh, as you like to find the information that you want. And you can see my cursor on the left is moving, but it's also moving a little cross on the right. So you compare it, can compare exactly, um, you know, to, to find the point that you want to, to find. Um, and you can um, switch, switch the kind of um, mode um, instead of having side by side, if you switch up here from swipe off to swipe on, what we have instead is basically um, one geographical area on your screen, but you're able to slide the map over and across. So again, really useful for um, uh, seeing really accurately the kind of change in land use over time. Um, I'll just open up a little example of a site that I thought was quite interesting to look at. Um, this way. Here we go. So when we look at um, North Cairn, I'll zoom out a bit so you can see where we are. So we're at the north end of the Rins here. Our map's disappeared entirely because we've zoomed out too far. Um, where is it gone? There we go. So here you can see, for example, the Cairn is marked. Um, uh, on the Ordnance Survey map there, um, and, but it's quite useful uh, to be able to compare um, the difference between then and now. You can see the cairn on the map is marked as a sort of a nice, clear, vaguely round um, sort of uh, remains, I suppose. But when you scroll that across, take that away, you can see actually zooming in, there's really not much left. There isn't a kind of nice, clear pile of stones. Um, you know, a lot of that material has been removed. And so it's quite useful to be able to compare, um, particularly with these older maps, um, things that might have been more clearly visible in the past with the satellite data to see how they might appear today. And then to take the opposite uh, over here, we have the radar station at North Cairn. Some of you might hopefully um, be joining my colleague um, on a walk to the radar station um, next week. But here you are, you can see it on the aerial imagery, but of course it doesn't appear on the mapping yet, um, it hadn't been built. So really useful for finding, um, uh, you know, for being able to track land use through time, basically. Um, well, one other useful thing that I thought was useful to point out, um, if you're trying to find the exact location of something, if you can see in the very bottom right-hand corner of my screen down here, hopefully you can see that those numbers are moving all the time. If you're trying to find the exact, um, uh, grid reference for a certain site or location for any reason, that might be quite a good way to do it. Um, uh, oh, I mentioned earlier, didn't I, about how um, sometimes um, artifacts, um, we might have um, records for uh, sort of chance artifact finds, for example. So we'll go and have a look quickly. One of my favourites. Um, here we go. Kelt found. Um, so it doesn't mean a Kelt, like a person, doesn't mean there was a body found there. Kelt is um, a, a sort of traditional term for a stone axe head. So if you wanted, for example, if you were, um, you know, taking some time to look through some old maps and you saw something like that where it said, you know, Kelt found or some other similarly mysterious um, record is marked on the map, you could, for example, use your grid reference to go and find um, more information about that. So um, here, I've got the reference copied in my Word document already. I'm going to take that over. Um, but you can see the little, that little square at the bottom right-hand corner. You can see that it has the grid reference of just where my cursor is hovering. So if we go back to past map quickly, I can put the grid reference in there. Here we go. And so it zooms me right in and you can see we have this little blue dot here, axe head stone. Um, and we can open that window. And there we have all the information about the, um, that axe head that was um, recorded as having been found um, on the um, OS map there. So you can see there really isn't an awful lot to go on often with these um, uh, sort of older finds. There isn't much. Um, there isn't much more beyond the fact that something was found there. You know, in the um, decades or centuries since they were found, um, they've um, 
uh, kind of uh, fallen fallen out of <laughs> fallen out of the system, I suppose. Um, but this one, it must have been found in the uh, sort of late nineteenth century. It's recorded in this um, in this um, publication down here. But yeah, just um, just another way of kind of um, putting the information together, taking your grid references from the map websites, and um, particularly putting that into Pass Map. Um, you can then zoom in on that exact area and find out any relevant finds. Um, that wouldn't work so well if you tried to put that into Canmore, for example, your grid reference, especially that was a sort of 10 figure um, grid reference that I was using there. Um, that would be too exact. Canmore would say, well, there's nothing in that exact spot because you're kind of accurate down to the meter. So pass map really is your friend there because it zooms you in on the area and then you can find the little blue dot that relates to um, any um, any records in that area. So those are the main four websites that I wanted to look at. That's been 40 minutes of me gabbling, which was about what I was aiming for, really. There are a few other sites that we could um, take a quick look at. And again, we'll rattle through them, but I'll send all the information. Um, we'll put all of this into a document if you want to look at it later on. But um, yeah, do put any questions that you have in the um, chat box there if you want to, and we can um, come and have a look at those. Um, but we might just look at a few of the kind of um, text text records um, uh, publications that might be useful also, um, as well as the um, more the sort of mapping websites. So one of the really useful resources that you might um, might want to look at. I'm sure lots of you know this already, but the um, Proceedings of the Society of Antiquaries of Scotland. Let me put that into the chat as well. Um, but you'll find loads of um, useful papers dating back um, years. They have uh, um, most of the records are available for free online um, here through um, through ADS, the Archaeology Data Service. Um, you can use the search term here. If you click on search, there brings up this little kind of query area, and you can put in. Um, obviously, you can select by year, or you can put the sort of site name or the author. Um, uh, and see if you can find um, publications um, about the site that you're looking for. So if you put in Rins of Galloway, for example, it only brings up um, one, one record, although relevant to our Celt, a uh, note on a collection of stone implements from the Rins of Galloway. So yeah, the proceedings of the Society of Antiquaries of Scotland are um, really useful, both for um, sort of antiquarian excavations and also a lot of the kind of modern um, uh, more modern excavations are um, uh, are shared, published through the uh, Society of Antiquaries today, so a really fabulous resource. Um, I can see someone has put in the questions, what is the origin of the name Rins? Now, I am by no means a place name specialist. We do have a talk um, next week on Wednesday the 29th. Um, about the Rins, although I have a feeling, did I see that um, our speaker from next week may be in the audience? I don't want to put her in the spot and ask her to contribute tonight. Um, although if, uh, if if she did feel like putting the answer in the chat, that would be fabulous. Or I'm sure um, Nick and um, Nick perhaps knows the answer if he wants to chip in, Nick. <laughs> uh, but I'll leave that down there. There's a, um, oh look, Ailey has just said, I'll add it to my talk. There we go. Um, so yes, you might like to um, uh, to sign up. The ask for that question might like to sign up for next week talk with um, Ailey Scamell, um, all about Gallic place names in the Rin, because I know that I am looking forward to learning a lot more about them. They are by no means my um, area of uh, expertise. Um, so a few other um, resources that you might find useful: the statistical accounts. These are really. Oh, let me put that in the chat as well. Uh, really useful for written records. There are the old statistical accounts and the new statistical accounts. And um, it can be quite hard sometimes to kind of um, sift through them and find what it is that you're wanting. Um, maybe let's just put in a sort of Rins, Rins place name and see what comes up. Oh, nothing. I'm sure I've done that before. Let's see if we can find. Um, well, it's not a hugely helpful example. Anyway, the statistical accounts are really, um, really useful resource for um, finding out about um, 
the um, it's, it, it's sort of um, historical information about um, uh, Scotland according to um, geographical area, and there are um, uh, lots of different volumes that you can look into, and it tells you all about um, uh, you know the sort of farming in a certain area and things like that. So those are um, a really really useful um, uh, a place to go to find out about things like that. And um, they can sometimes be a little confusing. These older documents, um, sometimes the terms that they're using to describe things can throw you off slightly. Um, you know, they had a habit, for example, in the past of referring to all sorts of things as Pictish castles, because Pictish sort of just meant uh, old. <laughs> um, so you do have to be a little bit wary when you're um, looking up these older records and um, that kind of um, language and terminology has changed, but they are um, definitely a fascinating resource for, um, uh, for finding out more about um, the past. Um, what else? Maybe the um, this one in here. Um, this is the archive of um, aerial photographs. Um, another really useful resource. You can see the branding is all very similar to Canmore. Again, it's a Historic Environment Scotland um, website. Um, but that has um, aerial photography from um, sort of the earliest aerial photography right up until um, uh, the more modern imagery that's being collected now as well. So you might find that useful. Um, someone had mentioned on uh, Facebook that if you're, um, you know, studying the past, you've got to go in and uh, take a look, look at the name books. And again, really useful resource. These are a bit like um, useful, kind of in the same way that these statistical accounts are useful. They give you um, information on um, how and why um, places were named in the way that they were. So really useful. I'm sure perhaps next week's talk will uh, uh, will touch on this as well. Um, one other thing I was going to mention was discovery and excavation in Scotland. This is very useful. Let me put that in there. Oh, I can just see I've been emailing. <laughs> Sorry, everyone. I've been emailing the last links um, to the last person who had sent a question instead of everyone. Let me copy those in there. All right, so hopefully those last three links should all be in there. Uh, where were we going to go? DES was going to be the next one. All right, so I was saying that um, the Proceedings of the Society of Antiquaries of Scotland are useful for um, everything from antiquarian um, records and excavations, but um, you know, even up to uh, much more modern ones, obviously they're publishing um, proceedings every year. Discovery and Excavation in Scotland is also a super useful resource, particularly for um, modern excavations, as the name suggests. It's a sort of record of everything that's been, um, everything that's been done, everything that's been worked on through the year. Um, and um, all archeological units, like the one that I work for, for example, we send in um, short summaries every year of all the work that we've been doing on um, all the different sites that we've been working on. So even if a site is far from being published, perhaps the work is still ongoing or we're in the post excavation stages of writing up reports and things, you might still be able to find updates um, and sort of short summarized information on um, what's been going on through discovery and excavation in Scotland. So that's um, produced by Archaeology Scotland, but a really useful resource for um, things that are happening now. Um, but you can see also it goes right back to the 40s. So, you know, a lot to, a lot to get into there. All of these records um, from Discovery and Excavation in Scotland, for example, when you go and look at a site on Canmore, when you look down in your references, um, you'll see information from here as well. All of these sources of information are all very much linked. Um, uh, you know, they all, all contribute to one another, um, but it's really useful to know about all of them independently as well. And then I really only had one more to look at, um, I mentioned very briefly earlier about scheduled monuments, but the Historic Environment Scotland website obviously is really useful. So um, uh, scheduled monuments are um, the most uh, significant monuments in Scotland. Those are the ones that have kind of been designated um, for specific protection. All archeology span um, is of course protected um, and that it can't be um, destroyed, but scheduled monuments are sort of especially protected. They have a, a very red line around them. And um, archaeologists aren't allowed to excavate them, for example, without very specific um, permissions from Historic Environment Scotland. So this is a really good website to go to if you want to find out, for example, whether a site near you is scheduled or how the scheduling process works, for example. 
Again, all of this information is fed into Canmore and PassMap. You can find out scheduled sites um, very easily on there. Um, PassMap, for example, you can, um, you can select the, um, the layer that only shows you the scheduled sites and doesn't show you the kind of all the other little blue dots, which are the non-scheduled um, archaeological sites. But uh, yes, another really useful way of, um, of uh, finding out more um, through through the HES website for scheduling.